Hello and welcome to the Runners Roll Podcast with me, Rick Pearson. And me, Ben Hobson. Today we're speaking with Andrew Corty and Ali Ball about running as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Pride Month. It's Pride History Month, isn't it? So yeah, so it feels appropriate to talk about it. And so they're going to come on in a sec. But before that, Ben, I've got some science. Oh, it feels like it's been a, it's been a minute since we had some science. Yeah, I've been... Um, Doing a bit of Googling and I've oh, I found some stuff. I've heard that is the best place for science. It is. It, yeah. Oh, it is. It's very reliable. Yeah. And this is about um, morning runners are happier and more productive. I am a morning runner. Tell me more. Well, there you go. So it says, a morning run uh, does more than kickstart your metabolism, Ben. Um, according to a new study, early morning exercises are more confident and engaged in daily tasks, therefore being better workers. Oh, right. Fine. So the research has found that physical activity before work increases challenge appraisal and decreases both hindrance and threat appraisal, which in turn increases engagement and work um, and, and decreases emotional fatigue and job-related worry. So that's a rather convoluted way of saying that you're a happier, better, less stressed worker after you've had your run. So how about that pay rise? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, don't, I don't think I need a pay rise now, <laughs> right? No, I'm just getting all those benefits. Yeah, that's just, it, yeah. just feel lucky. Running's its own reward. Running's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am a, yeah, I was actually talking to my, my, uh, my running pal and neighbour yesterday about it and he's like pure evening runner. Wow. He's like got him, like that's his. That's a dying breed now. I think so. It's a dying breed that. Yeah. 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 He, he, he tends, and it's purely like a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, it's the time he can get out when like kids have gone to sleep and all that sort of stuff. But I feel knackered by the end. I'm not, it's hard. Yeah, agreed. Less things on a practical level, very little can get in the way of the very early morning run, right? Yeah. So that's, I think that's the big tick for that one is that life can't, you know, happen too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a bit like, okay. just You just, you know, have to be up very early. Yeah, that's the drawback. I think actually in terms of like, like feeling like running, like you're warmed up to running. I think evening running. Yeah. You've I had a day of warming it. up. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there's not many evening races, but I always suspect I would run better in an evening race. I think so. What about like a later start in the morning race? How does that? Yeah, that would be better as well. I think. Don't you think? I feel like if you're running, say, like five k or ten k, and it's like nine a.m. Like I don't, I'm, it's just a bit of a shock, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you've got to get that warm up dialed in. Yeah. If yeah. you're not ready to, yeah, that's true. If there was like a one p.m. race, there's not a lot of them. I'm already panicking about the nutrition strategy. That's, I mean, anything, yeah. anything that deviates towards that, I'm like, oh, what if I feel full? What if I fi- what if I've misjudged the uh, the lunch window? <laughs> yeah, panicking yeah. already, Rick. I'm panicking already. Okay, no, just stick with your morning runs then. Stick, stick with your morning runs. Um, you you actually well, you're not running much at all, Ben. I mean, are you, mate? No, I'm, I've jumped, jumped on board the injury train. Oh, lovely. No, I've lovely start to the year. Yeah, absolutely in th- thriving in that situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm picking the mysteries of some uh, some quite aggressive nerve pain in my my right leg, stemming from what seems to be my SI joint. Okay. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a ham. I thought I'd done something to my hammy, and it was just like annoyed my sciatic nerve, and then it's sort of like as these things do, it snowballed. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm sort of deeply uncomfortable for quite a lot of the time. Oh mate. Yeah. It's, it's annoying. Yeah. And like it makes you think, uh, especially when running's going well. Yeah. And it's not like a muscle tear or a thing like that. Yeah. It's It's. It's basically my skeleton has let me down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Which, yeah. It's slightly you know, more concerning, isn't it? Skeleton, don't we? You know, I've tried hard to, to do this. So anyway, um, I've I've gone to see Gareth Cole, who's been on this podcast oh, yeah, a few yeah, times, yeah, yeah. A, a man of great wisdom, and we're picking apart what it could be and how to fix it and stuff like that. But I'm sort of cro- encroaching towards get a scan sort okay. of territory. Yeah, it's quite serious, isn't it? It's never... Looking inside the body using magnets, which is what I'm going to, <laughs> this is the next phase of this, is, yeah. means something isn't great. Yeah. But as with all these things, Rick, I, I kind of you, I treat the injury stuff as like you try and avoid it as much as you possibly can. Yeah. And inevitably something comes around and you kind of hope for the best that it's not, it's not too bad. But um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not the, the start to the year that I was expecting. Yeah. Or, but, you know, it is the start of the year. There's still so much more time. Absolutely, yeah. So, it is, it, it's unfortunate. It's part, it's part and parcel, isn't it? In, like, dealing with injuries is mm. part and parcel of being yeah, yeah. a runner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really is. And I think that's been probably the sort of major... I mean, I'm not going to downplay it. I've been pretty miserable about it. Yeah. But I think that there's a lot of... There's a lot to take away from, like, if you dwell on it too much. Yeah. Being like, oh, why me? Oh, and it's like, yeah, well, actually, yeah. because, like... 
you must know it just happens yeah and yeah. that's that's part of it so um yeah you know we'll find out what we'll find out what happens but uh yeah nerve pain nerve pain's mm. not great no. muscle pain is is better than nerve yeah, yeah. pain bring back muscle pain I'm gonna rate my pains yeah. here Favorite kind of pain? <laughs> no. So yeah, it's uh, it's, it's it's not really bad. But Run, still- running pain's the best, isn't it? Sort of five k pain. Oh, yeah. Muscle pain and then nerve pain right down the bottom. Oh, gross. What about you? But you're still running, so that's I'm fine. I'm still running. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, I had a bit of a time of it with you know, I had to, I'd had to have knee surgery for, what, a couple of years ago. Um, we're great adverse for running, aren't we? Um, but yeah, uh, doing all right. Doing a lot of off road stuff because I've got the Orion 15. And I was like, so that's in like a month's time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I signed up for it. It's, it's not looking it's, unlikely. It's looking unlikely. <laughs> but it's very hilly and very muddy. So I was like, I need to, I'm not scared of 15 miles of the distance, but terrain and hills are something I need to, so I've been really trying to work in yeah. that. So I went back on the London Loop, which is a, a route I'm really into. So that, And it is hilly and muddy. Um, so I did that and go going to go back there next weekend. Uh, which bit did you go to? Did the bit that's kind of um, the wilds of Croydon. So yeah, which is actually some of the nicest. Yeah, it's bit. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was it was it was quite up and down. So going to do probably going to do like a fourteen mile thing next weekend, and then hopefully get that in the bag. And then I feel I kind of get to the start line thinking I'm not I'm not blagging this anymore. Do you know what I mean right? Like it's, I think it's a very good race. It's not as if I'm going to be like troubling the the lead pack. But um, yeah, I, I won't I won't sort of um, I feel like I can do myself justice, which is the idea. That's very good. 40 miles three weeks out yeah that gives you time to really you know I think then spend some focus on some pure effort exactly and I think as a, I'm not a coach Ben as you know but I always think that Google some more science that it is a common mistake I think is, is to get much more applicable to marathons but where people do their longest run that they're ever going to do before the race only three weeks out because I yeah. think if anything goes wrong and it's much more likely on a, like a long road run I think you haven't really got much time to recover and you just got panic. Whereas you, you could arguably do that five or six weeks out. Yeah. And then maybe go back up a little bit with three weeks up. But, it, but it's, it's not all riding on this one run going really well. Yeah, yeah. And then if it doesn't go well, then what, what are you left with in terms of like your confidence, what you could look back on? Yeah. I completely agree. Here's a, here's a one final challenge to sort of yeah, like, utterly destroy yeah. your confidence. And 22 what you mile, three weeks out. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like, it's really, it's risky, I think. Yeah, so. it is risky. Oh, well, I mean... Even if I can't run, which is very unlikely, I'll, I'll try and come along and shout. Oh, at you, please, mate. yeah, yeah. yeah make a fun. maybe make a poster or something. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, fine. Sure. What do you want me? Can I? Uh, what do you want me to? Uh, yeah. encouraging or abuse? Which one do you want to yeah, go? Up to you. Turn it up to you. Fine. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, let's bring on our, our guests of the week. Let's do it. Guest of the week. Here in the studio. Guest of the week. Sometimes on the phone. Could be an athlete. Today we're speaking with Andrew Corty from the Front Runners and Runners World's Ali Ball about running as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Hello. Thank you. Andrew, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, your own running journey, I guess? How, how did it begin for you? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess it originally began when I was at school. I was actually more of a like, 50, 100, 200 metre sprinter. Okay. Did a bit of cross country, but that was mainly just to get out of the way. <laughs> um, and then didn't really do anything. I was a, my, my LGBT plus sports background was really in football. Um, I actually played for many, many years for one of London's LGBT football clubs. And it was a friend of mine who I knew at football who said, oh, I'm going to run a 10K in whenever it was. Um, would you fancy doing it? And I said, yeah, OK. Okay, why not? Let's give it a go. And he said, "Oh, by the way, I'm a member of this club called London Front Runners. Um, why don't you come along to one of the runs and just for a bit of a practice?" I was like, "Yep, did that." And then um, did the 10k. It was the Front Runners Pride 10k. Um, and then a year later, moved into London, joined, and that was 16 years ago or so. And that wow. was that was how I got back into it. What about you, Ali? What's your running journey? My running journey. I I wasn't really into sport when I was younger, so I only got into exercise in general when I was 16. Right. Um, it just wasn't pushed when I was at school. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really have anyone that I looked to and thought, yeah, I see myself in them, I would say. Um, so, yeah, it was only when I was 16 that I picked it up and then a few years later started running. So actually really later on in life, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then probably 
as is everyone, you sort of do a few races and then start doing more and then get the bug. And before you know it, you just keep saying yes to everything. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of like a swift spiral. Yeah, it does, it, does, it does spiral out of control, doesn't it? It does tend to spiral out of control. Um, what's, what's the most marked change you've noticed in Andrew from that first first outing with the front runners or that first 10K that you did? What's been the marked change uh, in the gay running community that you've noticed? Is it more representation? Are people more comfortable to identify when they're going running? What, what's the sort of big changes you've seen? Uh, I think it's been more of a, probably an evolution and gradual change. Um, I mean, certainly as far as London front runners goes, we're now bigger than we've ever been. So clearly there's a, a more of a demand for people who are interested in running, but also the social side of what we offer too. Um, and also if you look around the world, you know, there's more front runners clubs, both in the UK and internationally. So um, they're clearly offering something to a community that maybe is a bit more willing to sort of take a bit of a first step into a, into a running space that they feel comfortable with. Yeah, I was actually looking um, at a guy who joined the first ever frontrunners group in San Francisco in 1975. Um, and he, he said that the club played a unique role in the community at that time. Um, in the early 70s, there were only a handful of gay organisations and there weren't many gay activities that weren't centred centered around bars. So like no gay hiking clubs, track clubs, swimming clubs, anything like that. So I think it was the first gay group that a lot of people had joined um, and maybe their first experience of being around other gay people. And I think that's something that's probably still true today is that actually it's quite hard to find environments where you're around other people in your community that aren't centred around perhaps sort of alcohol going out. That's probably the first place you would think, oh, if I'm going to go find other members in my community, of course I'll go out on a Saturday night and go to a bar, whereas not everyone wants to go out on a Saturday night and go to a bar. For you, Ali, you're obviously like, you know, like starting running at 16. Have you ever wanted to join like an LGBTQ running club or? Uh, no, and I think that's because I came out a bit later in life as okay. well. Yeah. So I think for me, and I think this is probably a issue with representation in general. That I guess I never saw someone when I was younger, and this goes hand in hand with coming out, that I looked at and thought, yes, that's me. So. I probably looked at people who were in sport and didn't necessarily think, yeah, this fits the stereotype of who, like, well, they might have fitted more the stereotype of what people think a lesbian is. Whereas I don't see myself fitting into that particular field as much. So it's harder to then look at people when you're younger and think, oh, maybe that is me or maybe it's not. So it's probably only as I've got older and then you come to terms with your own sexuality. And I guess that's when it starts to be like, okay, maybe now I could join yeah, yeah. A club yeah. sort of thing. So it was never really, when I was younger, I think I probably thought that the clubs were for particular people, whereas I think they're a lot more inclusive and diverse than that. Yeah. yeah. Were well, you, Andrew? Because you sort of mentioned joining a, a, a gay football club. Was that sort of always the sort of the, 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 the first stage into any of these sports that you've got into? Did you want to find a community centred around the queer community or was it just you love football and you wanted to play football and it just the two things just happened to be together? I think the two things probably just coincided. Yeah. I mean, I've always been, I've, I've always, the most, most sport I've always done swimming, and I just do that on my own. So I was happy trottling along doing that. And then I can't remember quite how it happened. It was some website, some someone was organising some kick around on Parliament Hill. So I went and did that, and then that stopped. And it just so happened there was a new LGBT football club forming. And so I went along to that and ended up on the committee somehow <laughs> for, nine, <laughs> for nine years. Um, so. Uh, I think, yeah, for me, it was, I, I guess, picking up on what Ali said, I guess in football, I was never a particularly great football. I just quite liked playing it. And actually the thought of, for me, of, of having like a more community-based football club that was less out and out about ability sort of appealed as a bit of a, being able to do a bit of both. Um, and I think that's probably what appeals about London front runners and LGBT plus running. I mean, we've got plenty of members who are like second claim or have a second claim club who also run for other running clubs. We've got two members who are on the committee of other running clubs in London. Um, so it's it's not necessarily that people don't feel welcome in running more generally. Football's obviously got a slightly different um, sort of, I guess, perception um, of how LGBT plus friendly it is. Um, so maybe that, you know, that probably drives more people towards LGBT plus football. Although, again, actually, interestingly, in football, there's a massive difference between the male and the female side. 
Um, because if you meet, and in fact, I was talking to one of our runners who actually also started off in football, who's a lesbian. And um, it's almost like there's a, there's a bit of a joke, which is that if you play football in a regular FA affiliated football league and you're a female, you're probably a member of the LGBT plus community, yeah. whereas it's completely the other way for male football. Um, so it's a bit odd, whereas running's a bit more, a bit more even. Um, yeah, so started off in football and, and migrated into running. And it was, yeah, a bit probably a bit of, you know, I was never really did an awful lot of long distance running. So it's probably a bit of, here's something maybe I could have a go at, but at the same time, get a sort of social side and a community side out of it. Yeah, I agree. And I suppose, as I've said, I'm not a member of Front Runners, but I'm also not a member of other run clubs. I actually prefer to run with friends. And I think that probably is part of the reason why is because sometimes I go along to run clubs with people in my age groups or like in their 20s. And I don't particularly relate to some of them in it. So I think that's why it is important that we have more groups and that we also do just make the sport more inclusive in general so that people do, I guess, think there's something for me wherever. I don't just have to go to these certain environments or run with people I know, run with partners, etc. You know, we talked about the, the prior 10K. I'm wondering, is, is there anything that you think more races could do to be to become really kind of accepting and, and welcoming to the LGBTQ plus community? Um, I think... <sighs> I'm not entirely sure there is. I mean, I, yeah. I think if you, you know, if I enter a, a, a like a race, I don't get worried that I'm going to face any sort of hostility or yeah. kickback yeah. or anything. And I'll, you know, we all go along and wear our London frontrunner shirts, and a lot of people know what frontrunners is, yeah. and it's an LGBT plus set of running clubs. Um, so I'm not necessarily sure there is. Although I did, I did do the Cardiff half. Oh, at the yeah, end okay. of last year, and uh, I think it was about the end of mile eleven. They did actually have a stage with a couple of drag queens singing <laughs> on the way round. I Quality. did think oh, that's quite nice, but um, <laughs> no, I think in general it's it's just it's about I think just making people feel comfortable, yeah. um, and I think generally speaking that's the case. Yeah, do you think actually running, running compared to other sports? Is, do you think it's actually doing a re- relatively good job of this? Yeah, and, and maybe that, without wishing to get into the socio-economic demographics of the average runner, um, which is you know probably different to some other sports. You know, I, we, certainly all the time I've been in front runners, I've been on the committee six years and been in the club for about sixteen years. You know, we've never had any instances of like homophobic abuse or comments or anything else, or or never felt unwelcome at any event we've ever entered. And as I say, it's quite well known in some of the leagues that we enter and some of the races that we enter. That you know, we're an LGBT plus running club. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's just yeah, that's not so much of an issue. Whereas I say in football, you know, there's people a bit more wary, particularly male you know, gay, gay football players, a bit more wary and there is more of an issue with, you know, trying to make that sport more LGBT plus friendly and welcoming. Yeah, I think I'd say the same. Like, I've never gone into a race thinking, oh, you know, it's never been a concern, really. I think, I suppose, maybe for, like, non-binary people, it's more of a concern. Um, and maybe even just things like like non-gendered bathrooms or actually having a non-binary category can make those people feel like they're included. Yeah, that's probably one, that probably is the the, the sort of most immediate thing that a lot of races could do, was now that there's an option to have non-binary categories, actually think about having one. Yeah, yeah, that's probably... Definitely, I think. And I, I guess it's that, isn't it? I think we've talked about it off podcast is not just sort of slapping a rainbow badge on something and being like, this is what we're doing. It's like actually showing that everyone involved is inclusive and whether or not that is, um, as I've said, sort of like even volunteers showing that they are inclusive so that say you did get pulled off course and I don't know, you have to contact your next of kin or something like that, that you don't feel like you can't be yourself and Mm. honest in that sense. Well, tell us a little bit about the Pride 10K then, because this is, this is a great way. It's been going on for ages, isn't it? And it's like a highlight of the front runner's uh, calendar. Yeah, it has been going on for now. I can't remember how long it has been going on for now, but it's, um, it's run in Victoria Park, usually towards the end of the summer, depending on, on when Tower Hamlet's Council have got um, commercial, commercial things going on in the park. Um, it's a 10K. It's, um, it's, it's 
consistently voted for by runners as one of the favourite 10Ks that they enter. Um, it's got a nice community atmosphere, but it's also dead flat because Victoria yeah, right. Park is dead flat. Um, and we use the main path um, around the eastern side of Victoria Park. So it's very wide as well. Yeah. So you don't get much congestion. Uh, and then we generally afterwards um, have a post-run social party and then one of the pubs alongside Victoria Park all afternoon and the other thing actually about the Pride 10K is I think every year I've run it it's been gloriously sunny oh, I don't think there's been a drop guarantee. of rain yeah. guarantees <laughs> this year there will be but um, so yeah it's just a great community community run there's about a thousand people in the entry field so it's not a huge huge run but it's big enough Is that something that is looking to grow every year do you think? Obviously you're not an organiser but um, I, I, th I think there's a sort of venue capacity limit mm. which sort of restricts it to about, I think they have upped it to about 1250 or something, but that's probably realistically at the moment as big as it's going to get. Um, and then you sort of think, well, is there going to, if you wanted to make it any bigger, you'd have to start thinking about moving venue and then you sort of maybe lose some of the, the history and the feel of it. So I think it's sort of there, there as it is for the time being. Is there anything that as a club that front runners find that they have to continue to be on top of in terms of like reaching out to people and, and diversifying the club and all those elements? Because I assume that there's a sort of everyone will come to us if they want to, perhaps. But, you know, is there sort of more of a, you know, oh, actually, do you know what we need to do more here or do more there? Is there this constant striving kind of? Yeah, there is. Um, so we're obviously representative of the LGBT plus community. Um, we've also actually got a really good range, age range of runners as well, from people in their like you know early twenties right through to people in their sixties and seventies. Um, so we're really good on that. Um, I think in common with a lot of LGBT plus sport, there are communities that we don't necessarily have very good representation from. Um, so the sort of black and minority ethnic communities um, was probably one area where we you know, quite like to attract more membership. Mm. We've sort of been trying over the last couple of years to get a bit more focus on the sort of equality, diversity and inclusion um, front, um, although I've struggled to find someone to sort of try and lead it who's then not had other commitments they've had to go off to, but um, it's something we'd like to. But then I say that I think that's, there's a wider issue with an LGBT plus sport about certain communities not as rep well represented as they are in the general population. Yeah. Mm. I mentioned you said that you, you kind of um, you probably started doing sport and then you came out uh, um, as gay. Like, um, did in, did running in some way give you like more confidence in who you are as a person? Did you think think it helped in that process or not? Um, yes and no. I think possibly yes in the sense of I think running. Obviously, a lot of people run for their mental health, yeah. and I think. For me, I've always quite liked running solo too because it gives me a lot of time to think. So I suppose actually it's that sort of thinking time that I have as a person anyway. So I think if my own mental health probably wasn't as good as it is, which is largely due because I do run and exercise a lot, then I would have probably found it harder to come to terms with as well. So I think it's almost like it didn't directly help so much, but I think it was probably a contributing factor for sure yeah definitely what else do you think we should be talking we should discuss um as ali's actually already picked up on so the first front runners club uh was started off in san francisco um and actually was originally called the lavender u joggers okay so back in the days before the internet um the concepts of distance learning was basically these sort of Uni well, there were sort of free universities, they were sort of called, which was basically newspapers where people would advertise classes. Okay. So they started off, there were two guys, um, one of whom was slightly improbably named Gardner Pond, um, and I think the other one was Jack Baker, um, who put in this advert for a learn to jog class. And that's how it all started. And so they started in like 1975, I think it was, um, in San Francisco. Um, the, the 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 lavender U paper that they advertised in uh, eventually folded, um, and they decided roughly at the same time to that they had to actually form into a proper running club, um, and therefore needed a name. Um, so what they did was um, there had been a, a novel that had recently been published called The Front Runner um, by an author called uh, Patricia Nell Warren, um, which was the interestingly I didn't I hadn't realised this was the first 
work of contemporary gay fiction ever to hit the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and it was about a, a, a gay coach and uh, trying to get a, an openly gay athlete into the US Olympic team and end up having a love affair and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so they borrowed the name without even asking um, and, and hence San Francisco frontrunners were set up. Um, and then in 1980, I think it was New York, um, someone in New York decided they would set, up, set one up. Um, Mid 80s, um, a couple of um, events happen where there happen to be runners from across the US. So um, there was actually, it was again, lesbian um, like chorus group um, where a number of runners happened to be. But also it was the second gay games in San Francisco. Um, and that sort of led to the formation of what became international front runners. Although interestingly, the first, the first meeting only seemed to have clubs from the US in it. Um, <laughs> it. It took until the second meeting to get a couple from Canada to be able to call it truly international. Uh, so that's a sort of genesis of, of, of front runners. It's, it calls itself a, an affiliation of clubs. Okay. So it, it really is a load of autonomous clubs that just sort of operate under a, an umbrella and cooperate with each other. Um, so for instance, um, I'm heading down to Australia in April and I'm going to try and get a run in with one of the Australian front runners clubs and you sort of get people popping up away on holiday who yeah, yeah. suddenly come along to a run and stuff like that so that's quite nice um, you know it's now got 100 I think it's around 120 clubs in international front runners yeah. not all of whom are called called front runners uh, so that's sort of how it all, all started off and where it's got to and in the UK so there's London front runners yeah what, what, what other um so there's about 15 clubs in the UK. Oh, great, OK. Yeah, so yeah. furthest north, I think, is Glasgow and Edinburgh, yeah. right down to Brighton in the south. Yeah. Um, there's a new club apparently forming in Bristol, so they've got new Bristol front runners. Yeah. Um, so, and then you obviously got, you know, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, some of the, like, Birmingham, um, some of the big cities in the UK. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the UK actually has the second highest number of front runners clubs. Yeah, I thought it did after the US. After the yeah. US, which is about half, about half of them are US. Yeah. Um, and then Canada, I think, comes in about third, and then you get you know, there's a handful. It's in great though to have that international network, isn't it? Because like, whenever you go on holiday, you can, yeah. you've got <laughs> you can kind of find like, someone. Yeah. Yeah. Right mates. That's yeah. it. And I like that they sort of all operate on their own terms, but come together. It, yeah. There's something that feels quite nice about that. Yeah, and there's some. You, know, you look at where some of the latest ones and the newest ones are forming around the world. Um, so in the last probably like two, three years, there's been the first one set up in India, Bengaluru yeah. front runners. Um, there's there's a there's a front runners club in Suriname, Suriname front runners in Paramaribo, um, and then more recently um, there's just been one set up in Manila in the Philippines, um, and before that was one in Kuala Lumpur. So, um, which is interesting because they're sort of starting to spread out to countries that you wouldn't necessarily associate with being particularly LGBT plus yeah, friendly. I mean, yeah, I think that's that's really significant because you've got. And people, Ali, as you've said, you've never really, there's never been barriers. You guys have put on races and entered races and never felt any pressure or any sort of fear of being homophobically, like, targeted. Whereas, obviously, these nations, some of the, and where some of these clubs are now starting up, some of these nations have, you know, quite strong anti-gay legislation from a government, religious, whatever point of view. There's very much like a, you know, and that's that must be very... I mean, that, for the for the club, it's very it's it's a big move. Yeah, and you know, if you, even if you go back to San Francisco when they first founded, when they first formed as a proper running club, they had something like forty members, mm. and there's a note there that says pretty much everyone signed up to what was then the membership book um, and had their names and addresses in the membership book. And as he says, that was a you know that was a pretty bold move on on those members part at the time even in even in san francisco back in the mid 70s uh, yeah so for i guess for now yeah you're right in some of those locations it's very much a safe space for people um who maybe are nowhere near as comfortable coming out in the community or at work or with family so yeah it's really encouraging to see yeah agreed and i think from a perspective that sort of international running and like a lot of people do travel to other destinations now to do events it's nice as well even if you're from a country that is pretty pro the community it's nice that you could think oh it gives me hope that I can travel to these other destinations and feel like I'm 
included there. Oh, totally. Yeah, oh, yeah. Totally. So if someone was coming from the Middle East, yeah, and they could join, you know, and they this, you know, and and do it in whatever way they wanted to do it openly, or just meet the community and not be, but they can still find a running community which they can identify with and and, and join. Yeah, in wherever they go. Do you yeah. ever do you ever have that, Andrew? Maybe people who are coming from. Say, say the Middle East, they come to London and feel, and then they run with the front runners and it's actually this kind of very liberating experience for them that they may not be able to have, feel they could have in their own, in their own country. Um, probably not quite so much because I guess uh, the, the people we tend to get guest running with us tend to be from other front runners clubs because okay. they know there's that network there. Yeah. I suspect if you aren't aware that there's this network, you're possibly not going to find it or it's not something you're going to be looking for when you just go on holiday. So not quite so much, but um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see as, as, as more clubs start up. We may get, we may get a few. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, anyone who listens to this, they now know. Yeah, they do indeed. Yeah. yeah. So if you're coming on holiday to the to the UK, get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is the website, Andrew? That's what the website is. So it's www.londonfrontrunners.org, um, and London Frontrunners. That's all just one word. And, and as far as 2024, then what's the what are some of the highlights that Frontrunners are looking? So oh crikey, there's a loads going on at the moment. So we've just. The club is getting bigger and bigger every year, which is great from the point of view that enables us to do lots of different types of running with, that suit different people. Um, we've just started up a or restarted um, a weeknight run on Thursdays, which is now down in Clapham. Uh, you, we used to do one that was in central London, but post-COVID that sort of dwindled as people weren't in the office quite so much. Um, we've got an international trip this year going to Budapest. Um, so that's uh, later on in the year. Uh, so that's a couple of the highlights. So I'm in the process of organising the front runners' entry into the Green Belt Relay, which is a 220 mile relay, 220 mile relay race around London yeah. in teams of 11. And it looks like because it doesn't clash with Eurovision this year, <laughs> uh, we, we're actually going to field hopefully five teams. Oh so that's wow! 55 Amazing. runners doing that. Um, yeah, the, the 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 fact it doesn't clash with Eurovision seems to seems to mean that we've <laughs> got time that weekend. I love that. I love that. <laughs> I mean, there's some things you just can't miss. Yeah. And, uh, the Eurovision would be one of them. It's like a pillar in the community, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, no- normally when we do it, when they do clash, we get the hotel we stay in overnight to make sure they're screening Eurovision on the big screens in the hotel. Um, Andrew, thanks so much for your time. And Ali, f- thanks for coming on the, Thank the podcast talking about this. And, uh, yeah, wish you all your best with, with both your running this year. And, um, yeah, thanks for coming on and chatting about the, uh, the front runners as well. No, thank you. So that brings us to the end of this week's Runners World podcast. Huge thanks to our guests, Andrew Corti and Ali Ball, and to you, of course, for listening. You can subscribe to, I think, many different issues of Runners World. Um, we always say three for five pounds. It's probably still a thing. I think at some point there was some sort of sale for six for six pounds or something incredible. It was. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. It, all you need to it's do a deal. is deal. You're going to get some sort of amazing deal if you've not subscribed before. Google it, Runners World UK subscription. You'll find a link, and then once you go from there, you just internet it up, find the subscription, and you're away. Uh, distribute this podcast freely amongst your friends as well. Maybe they've started running in 2024. That's a good idea. Send them a podcast. We've got loads of information. Really like sterling service stuff focused on injury. Uh, that will get them through the, the, the early birds. I've got stuff I've got to re-listen to now, Rick. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Injured. Better get listening to some other stuff. Um, yeah, but thanks for joining us and you'll hear from us next week. <laughs>